and I'm here to show you how I made my new workbench base with traditional-ish joinery methods and surprisingly low-tech methods. So I only use two major power tools for this build and they are a circular saw and a power drill. Both tools which I think are pretty accessible for people to come by and also these joinery methods don't require clamps, which is awesome because clamps are really expensive. So I'll be showing you how to make self-clamping joints. And these joinery methods don't just have to be relegated to a workbench base, you could use them for any kind of table base. So before I start explaining the construction, let me tell you about what materials I used. So for the base, I used 4x6 construction lumber. You could also use 4x4, but I would not recommend going any thinner than that. For the joinery, I used dowel rods, two kinds, a one inch dowel rod and a half inch dowel rod. You'll need a power drill with various drill bits, a circular saw, a tape measure, a speed square, a pencil, a hammer, a small hand saw, some 120 grit sandpaper, and screws and washers for attaching the top to the base. Optional are a quarter 20 threaded inserts and bolts, and step down casters, which I used on mine so I can wheel around my workbench. So the joint use for the legs on this bench is what we in the business call a loose pinned drawboard mortise and tenon. I know it's a mouthful, so let me break it down. A tenon, traditionally, is a protruding rectangle cut from a piece of wood stock that is made to interlock with a corresponding mortise. A mortise is a rectangular hole. With glue and a clamp, this creates an incredibly strong traditional joint. Traditional tenons are integral, which means they are cut from the tenon stock. A loose tenon, also called a floating tenon or a slip tenon, is when you cut a mortise into the tenon stock and glue in an external piece of wood to functionally act as a tenon. Instead of gluing the mortise and tenon and clamping it to secure it, we are foregoing the clamps and using dowels as our securing point. Holes will be drilled through both the mortise and tenon pieces and a dowel will be driven through both to secure everything into place. Drawboarding is a technique used on a pin mortise and tenon where the holes in the tenon stock are slightly offset from the holes in the mortise stock. Therefore, when you pin it together, the joint becomes incredibly tight. More about this later. I went to Colonial Williamsburg about a month ago. And it was so cool because all of the houses and the furniture there and the joinery and stuff is all made by actual craftsmen in the colonial style. So the way they would have done it all those years ago. So here are some pictures of some doors and shutters and you can see on these doors there's the two pins for the pinned you know joint and on the timber framing there's these giant tenons with the holes cut through because they would use drawboard pin mortise and tenons in the timber framing and if you think about it it's it's the best way to go because in those times you're not going to clamp it together obviously if you wanted to do something like nails or screws, you would have to contract the blacksmith. That's an extra cost. So just using, making your own dowels, cutting these tenons and just using this self-clamping method is the best way to go. I started by cutting my stock to length. So my bench is 33 inches off the ground, which is a good height for me. And then the base is 27 inches wide. So that provided enough, you know, stability. And I used my circular saw with the speed square just to quickly make sure all my cuts are straight, you know. And while you're cutting these things, make sure everything's clamped down to stay safe. You don't want any slipping. And so I started with the legs, so I ended up with two posts, two top pieces, and two base pieces. And then using my circular saw, I cut a little angle on the base and the top pieces just for aesthetics. And another thing I did is I planed down all this material just to take off some of the gunk and make it a little bit cleaner. Obviously this is totally optional if you don't have a planer. It's not necessary, but I did it just for aesthetics. And now it is time to create the loose tenon. So I'm gonna take my big fat one inch dowel and I'm going to cut it using any kind of saw to four inches and I need eight four inch dowels. And then on the post stock, I mark the center of the post and then like a third from each edge. So I have two places I'm gonna drill holes. I'm gonna take my drill bit with a one inch Forstner bit. You can also use a spade bit. And then use blue painter's tape on your drill bit to mark the depth of two inches because our dowels are four inches long. We're gonna go halfway in on one side, halfway in on the other side. So I drilled eight holes in the marked positions into both of my post pieces. And for this build, we're really taking advantage of the fact that you're getting a pre-made dowel and you're using a pre-made drill bit. So you're not gonna have to do anything like, you know, shore up the tolerances with the tenon you cut yourself or on the mortise you cut yourself. It's, you can really rely on the tolerances between the one inch drill bit and the one inch dowel to be 
pretty tight, which is great for beginners because it just takes so much other stuff out of the equation. So to actually assemble these loose tenons, put glue into the hole and then a little bit of glue on your jaw, hammer that sucker in and it should be a really nice tight fit. Wait about, I don't know, four hours for it to dry. You don't wanna be working with this while the glue is not fully cured. It's not good to be impatient. I like to plan my glue ups like at the end of the night so then I can just go to bed and come back to it in the morning and then I don't like have to worry about waiting and then you know everything's gonna be nice and dry. So after these tenons dry into place, they are functionally integral tenons. I'm telling you, they are going absolutely nowhere. So now it's time to transfer these tenons from your post to the base pieces. So mark in the center of your base piece and your top piece and transfer the one inch hole markings and then drill another two inches into each of the base pieces, each of the top pieces, so you have your all your matched up dowel joinery. And let me warn you, dowel joinery is really hard to line up, for me at least. I know it's like a beginner form of joinery, but like I've always really struggled with getting those things to line up. So one thing you can do to help yourself out is take some 120 grit sandpaper or a chisel or even like a dang pocket knife, I don't know, and taper your tenons a little bit. And that will make it a little bit easier for assembly points when you're trying to get those two pieces lined up because it's gonna be a really tight fit anyways. Another thing you could do is give them the old razzle dazzle and drill at a slight angle to widen up your hole a little bit because when you assemble this, these tenons don't need to be like deadly tight because we're doing the whole pinned aspect of it. You just want them to all fit together and like be able to reasonably take them apart while you're, you know, figuring all this out. And so now that we have the basics of our legs put together, we're gonna do the pinned and draw boring part of this process. So we're gonna take my smaller dowel, which is a half inch in diameter, and I'm gonna cut eight pieces that are slightly longer than the width of the base. So I know that it can go all the way through with a little bit of excess just for safety. And then moving to my base pieces and my top pieces, I'm going to mark the center of where the tenon comes through and about halfway to the depth. And I'm going to drill a half inch hole all the way through. So I'm go on either side, and that's gonna be the entry point of the small dowel. Once you've drilled all those holes for the dowels, do a dry fit of everything, and then take your drill bit and mark the point of where the dial locations are onto the tenon. So I'm sticking my drill bit in, I'm pushing it down a little bit. No, I'm not drilling all the way through right now. I'm not drilling anything. I'm just using the point on the Forstner bit to transfer that marking. Transfer all those markings, take everything apart, and take a look at your tenons. You should see the little point marks from where you transferred the drill bit. And this is where the draw boring technique comes in. So what you do is instead of just drilling all the way through at the same level, you take the hole from the tenon stock and you move it slightly closer to the base of the stock. So you can see here, the holes are now offset. So when that dowel goes through, it does a little razzle dazzle. And with that little wiggle it does, it pulls that joint in even closer together move that point slightly closer to the base. I'm talking a 16th of an inch or a 32nd of an inch. I am begging you, I've done this before like a lot. I am begging you not to overdo the draw boring or else your dowels will be like. So just move it slightly closer to the base of the tenon stock and then drill your half inch hole all the way through. One last thing before we do the assembly, you have to taper all of your small dowels. So this will make it easier for them to travel through that drawboard joint. So take some 120 grit sandpaper and just taper the ends. And now it's time to assemble everything. So put glue in the holes, put glue on your tenons, slap those babies together, add some glue to your dowels and drive them home. And once the glue has dried up a bit, take your handsaw and cut off the excess dowels. And that's it for our leg assemblies, so we'll move on to the cross brace. For the cross brace, you can really use anything. I used two 2x6s two because it was just scrap that I had around. So the first thing I did for the cross brace was for each one at the center, I drilled a hole and inserted a really tiny dowel, and this is just gonna be for alignment purposes during assembly and construction. Then on my leg pieces, I drilled really big recesses for washers and another hole all the way through that corresponded with the cross brace. So that'll be where my washer and my bolt comes through and attaches to the cross brace. And just a tip, whenever you're doing something like this, the big recess and then the smaller hole, always drill the bigger hole first and then the smaller one. And back to the cross braces, I transferred the markings from that small dowel onto the leg pieces and drilled a hole. 
and then I dry fitted everything. So see how that alignment post really helps now because I can easily mark where I need to make the holes for the bolts to go through um, without having to do any like weird like octopus hands kind of deal. So I sent my drill bit through and marked where the threaded inserts need to go. So for this, I did a quarter 20 bolt and a washer and a threaded insert on the cross brace just because I love threaded inserts, but you can also use screws. You don't have to use threaded inserts. And if you want to know how to install threaded inserts, I already made a whole video about that, so you can check that out if you want more information. But yeah, I drilled the holes for the threaded inserts. I did actually add a little bit of super glue to the threads before I installed to make it extra strong. And then I put everything back together, tested out the fit, and... We are almost home free. And let me tell you, this bench, it was feeling chunky. I was so excited. And as for attaching the tabletop to the base, I just drilled holes all the way through these top base pieces with a very large recess for one of those fat washers. And I used these really big lag bolts to just screw the top to the base. And surprisingly enough, this was the hardest part of the project. Take a note from me, do not make the top cross brace as thick as the bottom. The bottom one, it's good to have a really thick bottom base piece. The top one does not have to be as thick because it was driving me nuts trying to get that drill all the way through the six inches of the top and then get everything lined up. It was like really difficult. So just like don't make the top base six inches tall if you don't want to. <laughs> and I sanded the whole thing down, which is like super boring so I didn't show it. And then it was time for a coat of paint. I had this giant paint bucket of navy paint that I put on everything in my shop. I just think it's the best color, especially with the oak. I love how it looks with the oak. Um, and I feel like the paint really elevated the look of this because it's, it's a pretty low tech build. It's a pretty, you know, it's not the fanciest thing ever, but... And then after the paint dried and everything was assembled, I added some of my accessories like my vices and the step down caster so I could wheel it around. And that is the finished build for this bench. I'm so excited about it because it is the most stable, chunky bench I have ever laid my eyes on in my personal life. I was prompted to make this because my old work table, whenever I would put something in the vise and handsaw, the whole thing would literally wobble like crazy. And this one is just completely stable. Anytime I'm trying to saw it, it's really awesome. Um, but yeah, so that's everything. I hope you learned something and thanks for watching. Bye! Thank you.